Last week we left off uh, with Bill Dad uh, giving his final two cents in, in this conversation, and uh, it was a pretty short, it's a six verse chapter, pretty, pretty short speech, uh, and he's basically declaring, you know, how God is absolute sovereign and cannot, and cannot be resisted, uh, that God puts everything together and causes it to work and his power is limitless. And, and he's basically, we think, using this as a, uh, a to, to criticize Job and saying, you know, you're, how can you as a person uh, question God or, or how can you claim to be pure before God? Um, and, and he talks about how, it, it really, he gets, uh, verse 6, how much less man that maggot and the son of man that worm. Now then, we talked a little bit about how what his, if you look at just his point of God's above man or humans, that that's an accurate point. God's the creator, we're the created. So that's, that's accurate. But then he talks about people as though God considers them to be worms and maggots. And is that the way God looks at us? See, I'm not sure that he's saying that's how God looks at us. <laughs> I think he's looking and saying, in comparison, in comparison to God, yeah, yeah, right. The, the attitude seems to be that we're just filthy and well, dirty, and, and in comparison, we, that would be correct, which is what yeah. kind of what we talked about. How? What well, is this Psalm eight? You know, yeah. who is man uh, that you would look upon? Right. So, 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 in, in a way, he's correct in what he's saying, but it seems, as as has been the case throughout this entire speech, the the where he's coming from seems to be the wrong direction, the wrong place. Uh, so, uh, th as we said, there's a lot that we can see here that is true and that we need to, to learn from, but at the same time, it's the, the direction that they're coming from that, that makes it incorrect. So that's kind of where we left off uh, with, with Bildad, and we're, and we're ready for Job's response. And in, in chapter 26, Job responds to Bildad, and he rebukes Bildad and magnifies God's great power in the universe. So this is where we start to see some of that uh, discussion about um, God's creation to some degree here. Um, and he seems to have realized that he was attempting to reduce the infinite, eternal God into the limited con confines of his mind, of, of what, what we can understand. Uh, so, and you know, that's just not possible. God is the beginning and the end, and he's too big, too, too expansive to fit into our limited thinking. Uh, you know, you know, I don't know if those of you who like science fiction or anything, you might see, see movies, some of them talk about how, I think the one maybe like Interstellar where they talk about like a four-dimensional being versus a three-dimensional being and, and things like that. Like, we can't understand God because he doesn't, he's the creator. He exists outside of what we under, understand. Uh, so we can't grasp that fully. We can only grasp what has been revealed to us. Uh, so uh, that... He, he seems to start being able to realize that at, the, at this point, or, or that's kind of come into his thinking as they've had this discussion. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and read it and, and talk about it a little bit. And uh, like I said, then after that, hopefully we'll have some time to get into some dis questions about these last couple of sections of, of speeches that, that Job and his friends have gone through. Then Job replied, how do you... How will you have helped the powerless? How you have saved them in the arm of this feeble? What advice have you offered to one without wisdom? And what great insight you have displayed? Who has helped, who has helped you utter these words? And whose spirit woke, spoke from your mouth? The dead are deep anguish. Those benefit the waters and all that live in them. The realm of the dead is naked before God. Destruction lies uncovered. He spreads out the northern skies over empty space and he suspends the earth over nothing he wraps them up in the waters of his clouds yet the clouds do not burst under their weight he covers the face of the full moon spread spreading his, his clouds over it he marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary light and darkness the pillars are the pillars of heaven's quake against his rebuke again by his power he turned up the sea by his wisdom wisdom he cut rehab to pieces. By his breath the skies become fair, his hand pierced the gliding serpent. And, the, and these all, but outer fringe of his works, how faint 
the whisper we hear of him. Who can understand the thunder of his power? All right, so in verses uh, 1 through 4 here, Job, I think, sarcastically rebukes uh, Bildad and his friends by asking them who they're helping with their counsel. Uh, he, he said, basically, thanks for nothing. Uh, and in, in Job 4, he asks, whose spirit came through Bildad? He is implying that an evil spirit is corrupting his thinking and that it's not coming from God, or at least that it's not coming from God, whether it's coming from something else. If you remember, Eliphaz kind of claimed to have had a revelation uh, of some sort uh, earlier as we, as we were talking through. So, but he's, he's basically saying what you're talking about, you didn't get it from God. Um, so then he, in, in verse 5, he goes into uh, exaltation of God, and he reminds them that the vast universe is only a small piece of of what God's power is and, and what we can see. He says that those who have died are naked before God, and he discusses God's creation. Uh, and there's a number of different things that he talks about here. He says, God stretched out the heavens and holds the earth in place by his power. Uh, so in verse 7, that one, I wanted to note one thing here. Uh, back, I, you know, uh, when I was growing up, I think some Job was used as um, so in Christian evidences, because there's a lot of things in Job that we learn uh, that the people of the day would not necessarily have had knowledge of, and so they, you, you know, point to it to say, look, this is an example of revelation because they, they got this, they knew this at this point, and, and it's been proven to be accurate. Um, and in Job verse 7, it says, he stretches out the north over empty space, and he hangs the earth on nothing. Uh, and so some people have pointed to that passage is saying, you know, Job knew about how the earth is hanging out in, in space and rotating around the sun and, uh, and those kind of things. But however, we got to keep in mind here, who's, who's speaking here? It's Job, right? Job's doing talking. And is Job inspired? Not necessarily. Like some of the things that Job has said, weren't from weren't correct they were incorrect so we can't we can't rely on everything job says now then what like we talked about before the inspiration of the bible who 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 wrote the book would have been inspired but not necessarily the things that eliphaz and bildad and zophar and job some of those things are not correct so we kind of got to go from that point of view first off to say well job's not necessarily inspired in what he's saying here um However, uh, you know, so whenever he says uh, that uh, the empty, there's an empty space in the north, is he actually saying there's an empty space in the north where there's no stars? Because that was something that was discovered, and then people were, like, pointing to that as being, being proof, uh, scientific proof. And I didn't take the time, you know, I know that there's also been new stars discovered and all that sort of stuff with the telescope and everything, so... I didn't, because it's not, to me, it's not relevant in the conversation as far as whether he was accurate or, you know, whether that is true that there's no stars in the north or whatever. I didn't really go look and see what the most current update is on it. Um, but what, what, what is he actually saying whenever he says that, that phrase? He stretches out the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Right. It's, it's taking. Right? Yeah. It's taking yeah, a point. And, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. You know, clearly he's not making some scientific argument. He's pouring his guts out, just saying, like, I don't understand any of this. All I know is that God has power over all of this, and my life is wrecked. Yep. I mean, it, I think really it's another way to point his finger at God and say, you know, basically he, he's responsible. You're in charge, and you're responsible yeah. for this. Yeah. Uh, he. I think. Uh, I mean, he could just simply be saying God hung the earth on where nothing existed before. Like, you could interpret it that way. Like, it came out of nothing, and, and, he, and he just put it there. Uh, he could, it could also mean that he has a correct view of what the earth is and didn't subscribe to the belief of the day. 
you know, of, of some of the false beliefs. Um, I did see some scholars said that he's, he could be speaking against false deities because uh, the false gods were considered, the north was considered to be a meeting place for them. And so he's saying basically, uh, no, my God created the empty space and there's nothing there where you're claiming your gods are meeting. There's not really a discussion here of false gods going on, so I don't know that that, that would necessarily be the thought. I think it's more, I, I would tend to agree more with Jimmy that it's just basically saying God is great and look at what he created. Um, but, he was organized. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, the key is just, just to remember, as you're, especially as you're reading Job and, and in other places in the Bible, you know, people make, are not perfect and, and make mistakes. So whenever you're talking about the, the accuracy of the Bible and that it, you know, there's no errors in the Bible, there's no errors in the way the Bible was written, but what people say sometimes is not correct. Uh, so we got that. That's really the kind of the point here is that, and, and, and don't try to use something that doesn't as proof of something when it when it's not there. That's that's what we want to make sure of when we're when we're doing that. So uh, really, I think that this whole this whole section is just basically saying, you know, God created all this, and we can't understand everything uh, in it. Yeah, then he goes on to talk about how God controls the, the waters, and the water is suspended in the clouds and obscures the moon. Uh, I don't know, yesterday we had, I don't know if you guys got it here, but where we were, we got quite the rain that came down for 10, 15 minutes. It was pretty, pretty hard stuff uh, coming out of the clouds there. <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, in verse 12, it says that Job controls the sea, or God controls the sea, not Job. God controls the sea. Uh, you know, uh, in verse 10, he says that God provides the light and the darkness, inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters. Uh, you know, there, that's an accurate scientific statement about the Earth's round shape. Uh, so that, but there again, does that mean anything? Does that mean that Job had some kind of revelation about, about that? Yeah, yeah, so. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to, to there to, to claim anything. Uh, in verse 11, Job says, even the mountains tremble at God's rebuke. There again, back to what Jimmy was saying, kind of the, the greatness of God uh, and, and what he's done. Uh, in verse 12, Job says that God shattered Rahab. Well, I think we may have talked a little bit about Rahab before. Rahab, uh, you know, uh, could be the p pagan deity. Once again, going back against the false gods, some, that's what some people would bring into this passage, that he's, he's speaking against false gods. Uh, but uh, it also may be a term describing natural forces that bring devastation to earth, uh, earthquakes or, or, and such. Um, so there again, just emphasizing greatness, I think, all, th all through here of, the, of God. Uh, Job says that God's breath clears the heavens. Uh, could be talking about wind or, once again, just a, another visualization. Um, and, and Job concludes by saying all these things are only a fraction of the power of God. And uh, we can only see a small part of God and, and not possibly understand him. Uh, so when we realize the true greatness of God and how little we understand of him, what should that cause us to do? Big, Job's doing that here. Mm -hmm. There's no way. I, I think he's kind of um, maybe in a not so roundabout way confessing that he, he can never figure out all the mysteries of God. God yeah. is way beyond Well, that's, that's kind of, it's like when, as I read this, I was kind of like, he's starting to figure out some things, but then he turns right back around and, and says some other things here in just the next couple of chapters that it's kind of like the back and forth, like, debate with himself as, as to, well, this is, you know, God, this is God, and he's, he's way above me, and then the back to, why is he doing this to me, and, and well, yeah. See, that's what I'm going to say. If what I'm seeing here is frustration. I don't get God. I don't understand. Look, and tell me we don't have to go through this in our own lives. Tell me you've prayed for people, and yet the worst happened, and you're going, but why? That's 
I don't think it's just limited to Job. I think that translates to us today. For, for sure it does. Yeah. So we know God's powerful. We got that. We got the concept. Mm -hmm. What we don't understand is so we bow down before you, we worship you, we beseech you, we plead with you, and you say no. Right. And, we, and, actually, and actually you mentioned in there exactly what I was thinking. We worship him, right? Because he, he's, he's the creator. He's above us. And that's what, and you know, the, the, the people who worshiped false deities, that's what they were trying to do too. They were trying to say, well, we don't understand these things. But of course, the problem is, is that they didn't exist. They weren't real. Uh, so, you know, a person can only truly worship, uh, could not truly worship a God, yeah, could, could only worship, could not truly worship a God who's fully understood. If we, if we, if we knew everything about God, then w we'd be on the same playing field, right? Um, equal. And, and, we, and that would then, what, what do we worship? We worship something above us, higher than us, not something equal to us. Um, but God is beyond our comprehension. And if, if we realize this, we should be filled with awe and reverence toward him. And, and we're going to emphasize this more as we, as we get into Job's ne next section, the next section of Job talking. Uh, you know, we need to truly consider why God is to be worshipped and to really find out how he wants to be worshipped and worship him uh, in truth and in spirit, spirit and truth. You know, that, that, uh, that's a common thing that we like to say from, from the, the book of John when, he's, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, right? Uh, worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, you know, we need to realize that God deserves our awe and respect because of his great power and that he wants us to worship him. That's, that's a, also put throughout the scripture. Uh, the knowledge that God seeks us out and has provided a way for us to know him should cause us to be grateful, I think. Like, God wants us to seek him out, and, that, so we, should, and we should do that. Any other comments on, on 26 before we... Move on to our uh, quiz here. All right, uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started into this, this quiz. I have no idea how long this will take. It'll depend on how much you guys want to talk about the questions that I ask. Uh, I have a few questions. Just going back through uh, the, the, the last two, the second series of speeches and the third series of speeches uh, that, that we went through. Kind of like what we did when we talked about the first series. We, we had uh, some questions on that. And I, I like doing this because we don't cover the same ground usually. Like we're, we, we kind of, it's a kind of a review, but we also cover new ground. So that's why I like kind of doing this sometimes. Although this is probably the last time we'll do it in Job because the, the rest of the book is a little different and uh, we'll cover it a little differently, but um, as, as, at least from a teaching perspective anyway. So anyway, uh, first question, going back to chapter 15, where Eliphaz gives his second speech. Why does Eliphaz accuse Job of acting egotistically? You guys remember that? That's like, it'd be verses 1 through 9 of 15, uh, where we would see that. Uh, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to look over it and, and come up with an answer, and if you don't, I'll, uh, I'll give you it. At least what I think of it, anyway. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> All right, so, so I think Eliphaz accuses Job of acting egotistically because he says that Job thinks his wisdom is greater than that of their ancestors, uh, and that he thinks that he even has access to God's secret counsel. Um, one thing that's interesting about that is that, did, did Job maybe have more access to God's secret counsel than they did? He might have, right? We talked about that. Uh, it's possible that Job had, had a little more insight than they did into that um, based on the time period and, and, and that Job was the priest for his family. Uh, he may have well had some extra insight beyond what they did. Um, what sins does Eliphaz charge Job with in the second speech here? That would be in, in, in Job 15. We, we just, a, a few weeks ago, talked about what he charges them with in the third speech, which gets a little bit out of control. Uh, what's, he, what's he accuse him of in, fifth, in chapter 15? 
Well, yeah, they've been accusing him of wickedness. Um, he's, he says that he's being irreverent to God, which is kind of true <laughs> in some, some ways. Uh, he, he gets a little bit, Job gets a little bit boisterous, but is it wrong for Job to question God? Right. You just, you just expect God's answer. Right. Yeah. It's it's about it's a matter of how how defiant <laughs> is he is he being whenever he says this and and uh, but he charges him of being reverent to, to God and he says that Job's defense is an example of how he is wicked uh, and he accuses him basically of just being arrogant um, and then he goes through and kind of talks about what he's observed in life and how the wicked don't have a good life and of course Job will respond saying, nah, that's not, look, look around you. <laughs> like, that's not, that's not correct. Um, so what does Job accuse God of as part of his response to Eliphaz? That would be in... Uh, in, in chapter 16, uh, about 6 through 14, basically, he, he accuses him of uh, treating him violently or exhausting him, uh, throwing him to the wicked, breaking him and dashing him to pieces, using him for target pra practice, cutting up his insides, uh, basically just ripping him apart is what he, what he accuses God of. Uh, once again, uh, accurate to some degree. <laughs> uh, definitely put, it, put Job through the ringer. Um, but once again, not understanding the whole picture of what's going on. All right, so then here's, here's a big one. What witness does Job want to call on his behalf? In Job 16. If we read, uh, it's eight, 18 and 19. O earth, do not cover my blood, and let there be no resting place for my cry. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and my advocate is on high. Yeah, to God. They're the only power that he can appeal to, right? He... Um, What's interesting is that uh, how does this, how, you know, Job doesn't know it, but how does that need get realized? Through Jesus. Through Jesus. You know, you go to the New Testament, we see 1 Timothy 2.5. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 8.6 says that he's the mediator of a better covenant. And you can see it, there's other places in Hebrews where it talks about the, the mediator of the new covenant. Uh, Romans 5. Chapter 5 uh, really emphasizes, uh, I don't think the word mediator is in there, but it says uh, 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you go down to verse 11, not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Uh, so we, we know, we, get the, we have the benefit of seeing that Jesus is that, that mediator, and as being both God and man, and uh, being able to come and, and die on the cross for us, and it's not just—I think it's not just the death on the cross, but living as a person, uh, living that life, and 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 being able to say that he's both God and man. I think that's crucial there, as, as in being the mediator. So, what do we see that is Job's view towards death in these passages, especially in, in Job 17? What does he think about death? You can look in uh, 13 through 16 there at the end. It says, if I look for Sheol as my home, I make my bed in the darkness. If I call to the pit, you are my father, to, to the worm, my mother and my sister. Where now is my hope and who regards my hope? Will it go down with me to Sheol? Shall we get, go together? Shall we together go down into the dust? Is that a hopeful view? 
<laughs> it doesn't sound very hopeful. What's, what is his hope right now? It's basically relieve me of everything that I'm going through, right? Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about does he believe in consciousness after death? And maybe based on this passage, you would say no, but there's other passages that, that indicate yes. Uh, so, you know, as a, as a whole, he, he seems to understand that there's consciousness after death, um, but his view of death doesn't include the revelation that we have, uh, that, that where we, see, you know, in the New Testament about how, how the righteous will spend eternity with God and the, the wicked will spend it in hell. And that makes, you know, really, you, you know, how can we be right? You want to be righteous, and how can we be righteous? That's, that's kind of the part that I kept coming back to, you know, what we're talking about with Job 26, where he's talking about uh, the greatness of God and, and that we, as we were talking about, that we should want to worship God because of those things. Uh, it seems like it's really important. It's something that we should really focus on and really seek out. But when I look around, how many people really do that? And unfortunately, I don't think it's a lot. There, there, there are not very many people really understand how important it is that we seek out God and, and what he wants us to do and, and his righteousness. Um, okay, so then Bildad has his second speech in, in Job 18. What did uh, Bildad think had caused Job's situation? Of course, the, the general answer is, of course, all, his friends always all said, you did something really horrible, right? The whole, the whole time, that's kind of their basis. But what, he, he kind of zeroed in on something a little bit more here in Job 18, uh, verse 4. Oh, you who tear yourself in your anger, for your sake is the earth to be abandoned or the rock to be moved from its place. So he blamed Job's own anger. He's saying he's ripping himself to pieces with his own anger. Um, can we do that? And we talked a little bit about it. Can we do that? Can we cause ourselves problems by our own anger? Yep, for sure. Uh, in fact, that's something that we have to, those of us who have tempers have to learn how to control them, right? Because <laughs> we can cause a lot of damage, both uh, physical damage to things and other ways, if, you know, we got to, you got to control your temper. So anger can cause a problem. Um, of course, once again here, uh, not properly being applied. It's not Job's anger that has caused this. Um, and what expression does Bildad use to describe death? And that's in uh, 18, chapter 18 and verse 14. We talked a little bit about that. Uh, I think, and actually that could be, I think Charles may have mentioned that there's actually two different ways, or a different way to interpret that. Uh, King of Terrors, he says, uh, he is driven from light into darkness and chased from the inhabited world. Oh, excuse me, I'm in the wrong chapter, verse there. Uh, he is torn from the security of his tent and they march him before the King of Terrors. Uh, King of Terrors could also be God, right? I mean, you could, you're fear, fearful of God, but I think here he is talking about, like, in, he's talking about death, because that whole passage talks about death. Um, but, you know, people are afraid of death. It's the great unknown. Uh, you know, and, but we have a glimpse into what happens when we die. Uh, the, you know, from the New Testament, it tells us that we live with God for eternity because of what Jesus did for us. Okay, so uh, Job's going to respond to that as well. Uh, what did Job and Bildad agree on in these, in these discussions that they're having? And Eliphaz. What, part, what did they have the, that they all agreed on?
Nobody remembers that one? I didn't do a very good job, I guess. <laughs> they agreed that God was causing the bad things to happen to Job, right? Um, but Bildad thought that it was because of Job's sinfulness, while Job, Job thinks that it's because God's being unjust to him. Uh, so they're in agreement, and they're both correct in a way, because God's allowing these things to happen to Job, but both are wrong in why the things are happening to Job. Um, so how does Job feel at this point about how his family and friends are treating him? <laughs> yeah. he, he, he thinks that uh, instead of trying to help him, they are crushing him, right? So, uh, as we said, you know, some, some help you are, basically. Um, what's that? <laughs> yep. And we've talked about that, that, you know, we got to, and, and Christians, I think, are notorious for that, kicking people when they're down. Uh, and, and that's not what we ought to be doing. We ought to be trying to help people when, when they're uh, having problems. Uh, so uh, in chapter 19, uh, Job seems to have a moment of clarity uh, through his pain at, when he realizes that everyone has failed him. He, sa- he realizes that God is still his foundation. Uh, in 19, in ver- chapter 19 and 25, uh, and this is a pretty common verse, I think, that, that people know. It says, and as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will take his stand on earth. Um, so here, Job, once again, going back to my question earlier, he, he does realize that there's something that's going to happen after death. Uh, so I, I think you just got to, he, he's just going back and forth on things. Uh, that's why you want to reach over and choke them until they turn flat, because... Yeah, I think, I think it's a great example of how, you know, feel, you know you're going through with the, the discussions that he's having with his friends and his situation, and you go through kind of this, this back and forth with yourself as, as to what, what's going on and, and what you're thinking. Um, all right, so then in chapter 20, we talked about how Zophar discusses the fate of the wicked. Uh, you know, and what's his error... In, in his discussion, you know, a lot, some of what he says is, is accurate as to their, their end, uh, but what's his error as he, as he does, makes this, this discussion? He believes that Job is suffering the fate of the wicked. So he, he's, he's pointing out, he's using Job as part of his argument as to this is what happens to the wicked. Uh, and he doesn't seem to realize that the way he's applying his argument would also apply to him and to the others that are there. So it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't work logically uh, as an argument. Um, so what does Job then argue concerning a person's earthly circumstances in, in chapter 21? He says it's exactly opposite the way that his friends are, are claiming, right? That the wicked seem to prosper, um, how does he view prosperity or misfortune? And, and as he discusses it here. He doesn't believe that it's uh, in a person's hands, right? It's not up to us. Uh, it doesn't depend on whether we are righteous or wicked. And he has a lot more to back up what he's saying than, than his friends did, right? And why is that? It's because their, their whole argument is pretty much based on his situation. <laughs> they're using him as their example, and they're totally incorrect on that. 
uh, in fact, Eliphaz in, in 22 says that, you know, that Job's punishment implies that he's had some great, terrible sin. And you remember, what, sin, what sins does he charge him of in the third speech? That's where he gets really out there on, on making these accusations that he has no basis for. He says that Job abused the poor financially. He hasn't helped the poor and needy. He abused widows and orphans. And if you remember, and, and Job doesn't immediately respond to that. He responds to it later on, actually. Pretty, he goes down pretty specifically uh, to respond to those, those charges. But right as we were going through here, he doesn't respond to that immediately in, in that place. Um, does Eliphaz then have any proof of his accusations? Of course not. So what, what's the major lesson that we talked about that we can learn from Eliphaz here? Because I think it's pretty important that, that we get that. Nobody learned it. Don't get friends like Eliphaz. <laughs> Don't get friends like Eliphaz. <laughs> We talked about not making assumptions whenever we're, uh, you know, having an argument with somebody or, or talking with somebody or even trying to comfort somebody. And whatever the situation, don't make assumptions of things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We. It's, it, you can't, it, being right at all costs, at any cost. Uh, we, do, we don't want to be there. We, we don't want to be doing that. We can't, um, just because you go into a discussion thinking you're right, if the other person proves you wrong, you don't go making up stuff to try to prove yourself right. Um, so I think, especially when you're dealing with somebody who's hurting, uh, that, that we, we were emphasizing that because that's what we're talking about here. But I think that's true in any well, no, I don't think. I know it's true in any, anything. I mean, if you're having a scientific argument and somebody proves that your scientific argument's wrong, to try to make up facts to, to do it, to, and, and you know, it's pretty common in today's world that that's happening, uh, that, that people will try to be right. Uh, Jimmy, I think you've talked a lot about that, about how you know, winning the argument at whatever the cost is. Uh, you know, that's... We, if we're doing that, we are definitely in the wrong. Uh, and we need to be able to hear what other people say. Uh, and, and, and certainly, we don't ever want to go to the, to the extent of just making stuff up. And in our mind, it may not be making stuff up. It may be that you've heard it somewhere or done you know, something. But if you're going to take a hard line on something, you better know it inside and out uh, before you do that. Uh, and a lot of that also comes back to how we go about the discussion. You know, if, if you're having some kind of a discussion with someone and you say, well, I, didn't I, I think I heard, you know, it, it, you can say, leave room for the other side. You know, I think this is the way it is or, or whatever and, and, and get a good discussion going. But whenever you are, are just adamant, like what Joe's friends are here, and, and you're, adam you're always you're arguing from the wrong side, uh, that's not going to get you anywhere. Um, so what does Job, in chapter 23, what does he admit about his complaints against God? In 23 verses 1 and 2, he says, Then Job replied, Even today my complaint is rebellion. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. So Job admits that uh, his complaint is rebellious and bitter. Uh, and, and so that's kind of, I think that's kind of in response to some of what uh, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar have been accusing him of. But of course, the problem with their line of thinking is when did he even start this talking this way? It wasn't before he, <laughs> all this stuff happened, right? When did he start questioning God? 
It was only after they started this conversation, right? So they're, they're, once again, their, their proof is, it's kind of like as they're going along here, it's like, oh, this is what caused the problem. But it doesn't make any sense because the order doesn't work in that, in that case. Uh, but Job does say some things that are a little bit out of place for, for uh, as far as speaking to God, but, and he, but he says, you know, I, yeah, I am a little bitter. And why is that? Because he's lost everything, right? And he's in a lot of pain, yeah. And, and, and I'm going to sympathize a little more here with Job, if you don't mind. The idea that he's in rebellion, as in, God, I'm not willingly accepting this, that's not rebellion. Right. You, you know, no, yeah, he, no, he, yeah, he's, he's, he's he, I guess he said my complaint is rebellious, not I'm in rebellion, like not I'm rebelling against God, but it's a little rebellious, uh, just in that, he, he, I think it's because he's questioning God. Yeah, he doesn't feel like it's fair. Right. And it's not. As, as the cliche goes, right, life's not fair. Uh, so, all right, well, um, we're out of time, so we'll pick up there, finish up uh, the last few questions that I have uh, that I'll answer uh, <laughs> on, 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 on this section of Job, and then, um, and then we'll uh, get into the, the rest of Job's uh, speech here. Actually, his, his final speech, uh, other than a little bit of a response to God then. So, All right, thanks, everyone.